We do not need to say very much about the events that culminated in the dropping of atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, this incredible, terrifying circumstance touched the whole world and resulted in the worst psychological panic we have ever known. Something happened that wasn't called out. Something happened inside of nearly every human being. And the more thoughtful and conscientious the person was, the more desperately he was affected by this tragedy. In the years immediately following the conclusion of World War II, many prominent citizens, leaders in every walk of life, uh, spoke their minds and their hearts on the subject of atomic warfare. They warned us with deepest sincerity that we, are, we were on the verge or brink of a condition so serious that only the ages could reveal the full import. Of course, one point was obvious even in 1946 and 7, and that was that the average citizen had very few resources within himself to meet the challenge of this transition from an age of relative security to an age of more than relative insecurity. It suddenly became obvious that this world would have to grow up and mature very rapidly if it was to survive its own scientific progress. Now the years have passed and on the surface of things we have become more or less adjusted. We have come to accept this peculiar kind of insecurity. Perhaps it was not very much greater in fact than the way we had previously lived. But the soul of man was hurt. His conscience was hurt. His sense of right and wrong was offended. Actually, we have always lived very close to the shadow of death. And on our streets and factories, death strikes every day. Yet this was something a little different. It was something that was almost too big for us. Something that seemed to reach out and make useless and worthless all of the common efforts that we could make to grow and be better people. As this situation gradually settled into our subconsciousness, we began to find that that which goes in must come out. We began to realize that in many ways our conduct was different. Something had been established within our own psyches that made it impossible for us to again be what we were before those fatal days. And as we watch what has come out of man in the succeeding years, we realize perhaps more really and more completely the degree of damage uh, from which we suffered. One thing is obvious to nearly every thoughtful person, that from the time of the atomic fission, 
Western culture, Western civilization, more than that, world culture, has slowly seemed to decline as from some kind of sickness in itself. We have lost anchorage in values. We have lost sincerities of purpose in leadership, in industry, in science, even in religion and art, we see as surely from stars of this occasion as we can observe the motion of the stars in the rings of trees. All of these changes man has had to face. And as a result of this tremendous um, upheaval in our own life, uh, we do observe a, 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 an increase in problems and a decrease in answers. We see the individual uh, less conscientious, less honest, less honorable. We see young people with less hope for the future. And there gradually comes that kind of reaction which might always accompany such an emergency. The desperate effort to cling to life while we have it. Uh, the lack of long-range planning. The insecurity of home and the rebellion of children. Everywhere this disillusionment has struck home. And it is perhaps especially difficult for us because this whole situation is so very close uh, to our own country, uh, to our own way of life, and to the ideals and dreams which we held of American leadership in world affairs, a benevolent, kindly, constructive leadership that was to bring men everywhere into a fuller opportunity for freedom and security and happiness. Some way, we took this very seriously, probably because it was the result of the ingenuity of our own people. Yet, what has been, has been done cannot be undone. And we have to try to understand in some way the reasons for what happened, and how these reasons must be valid, and how there has to be a great purpose in the things that happen to us. If the atomic bomb worked a terrible hardship upon our egos and our souls, it should also have brought to our immediate attention something uh, that we have already at least begun to forget. And that is uh, that there is no security in this mortal world. All that which is born is born to die. And whether this transition occurs in the fullness of years or in the prime of life, it is inevitable. Therefore, actually, the atomic bomb did not invent death. And since those blasts, we have killed many more people on the highways of our nation than died at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But these deaths on the highways seem to be sort of natural death, if we may dare to say that any death is more or less natural. Thus, in our psychic stress and shock, we were confronted by facts that we have always known. But these facts came upon us so cruelly, so intensely, so dramatically, that we were not able to cope with them immediately. Some of these facts we must review now because they are essential to a real understanding 
of the world in which we live and in which we have always lived. It is true that we have never lived under quite uh, such a strange kind of pressure as we now know, but we have never lived as such peculiar beings as we now are. It all fits together to make a picture if we can assemble the fragments. As soon as the atomic fact was known to us, we had a more or less desperate impulse to find something that was safe and sane and sound. And we looked around and we didn't find it. We didn't find it in society and we didn't find it in ourselves. Perhaps no phase of this experience has been more humiliating than the realization that it has brought of how unequipped we are to face major decisions. We have drifted along, becoming ever more dependent upon commodities and conveniences and securities provided by public means or by a private uh, purse. Suddenly we come upon something uh, that can only be solved if we think it through with every faculty and power which we possess. And we suddenly discovered that we did not know how to think. We had not even realized for generations what thinking means. We had confused thought with opinion. We had assumed the tongue was tied to the brain, and whatever way it wagged, it was telling eternal truth. This we now know is a delusion. We also realized that for years the philosophy departments of our universities were poorly attended. Uh, philosophy, at best, could only result in a more or less second class professorship in some school, where the professor would wander about the campus accumulating years until he closely resembled resemble dear old Dr. Chip. There was no real philosophic basis under our people. In the times of our great physical pioneering in the settling of this continent, and for that matter, pioneering in Europe or Asia before we got here, man had great spiritual convictions to sustain him. He had a kind of native courage that came from the earth. He was close to the earth. He was used to hard work. He was required to be inventive and ingenious in his own right. He had to use his mind to survive. And he gained a certain practical insight, which brought with it numerous moral and ethical um, consolation. This is no longer the way of our life, and today we are frankly afraid we have very little resource to cope with fear, faith is not strong, reason does not support us, the future does not look optimistic, and leadership does not appear solutional. What well, have we then? We have what we have had for a long time and didn't know it, and that is a kind of mental bankruptcy. In our desperate search for profits, in our belief that this world was a place in which we could keep on piling up cities, and that these cities would result in jobs, and these jobs would increase trade, and this trade would strengthen resources. All this line of thinking had taken over. And then suddenly, there was a tremendous shaking of the earth, and we were shaken off of our intellectual footing, such as it was, and left more or less in a chaos of confusions. In this emergency, we have 
taken various attitudes. For the most part, we have simply been satisfied either to be afraid or to try to ignore the whole subject. We have taken the ground that there is reasonable hope that we may live our life span and that the deluge will come to the future. Each year, however, it appears that hazards multiply. And as long as there are strong, ambitious persons uh, without very much ethics and very little regard for human life, power is a danger, an ever-present, immediate danger. And every so often, uh, these persons rattle their sabers or begin to pile up stockpiles of atomic bombs and the world goes again into a kind of nervous breakdown. So the answer has to be found. And the answer is always the same answer. That we, we meet these problems according to the resources within our own natures. Now we have been provided with these resources. They are not things we have to invent. They are there. They always have been there. But we have turned our attention to things we felt to be less laborious than self-culture. We have found that self-control is least pleasing to ourselves. Whereas to continue to do as much as we can in the way we want to do it holds the larger promise. These facts have been reversed by the situation that has occurred. Philosophy has always existed as a help to us in these hours of need. Philosophy has never been of the greatest interest uh, in those successful, sure generations in which persons were confident that they could control their own affairs. Philosophy has always been most vital when peoples were under stress and the need for serious thoughtfulness increased rapidly. Philosophy was once a noble and beautiful institution. It had none of this dull, dusty, moldy quality with which we associate it today. It has none of that uh, vicariousness, this impotent intellectualism, which we rather uh, regard as ridiculous. Philosophy was the result of man's first solemn and serious effort to understand himself, his world, the laws that govern it. In ancient times, philosophy was not separated from science or really from religion. They were one body of knowledge, but philosophy was that wonderful power in the mind of man by which all things could be made reasonable to be made understandable, and if need arise, to be made endurable. This type of philosophy we have great need for today. But when we neglect an area of learning for a thousand years, it is not going to be in excellent condition to serve us in need. We are told that if we have equipment, we must keep it up. Philosophy is the most neglected part of man's equipment. It has been allowed to fall into the hands of professional thinkers, much like the sophists of old, whose primary concern is merely to perpetuate their own intellectual contemplation. They have made a life of intellect. They have resolved that to them the most interesting of all worlds is the world of thought. And in this world they live and move and have their being. And in this world very often they also drown. Because the world itself has narrowed down 
with intellectual contemplation of imponderable is a very little utility the way we have nursed it in recent centuries. But now, the word philosophy must have a new meaning. It must mean the ability of the individual to think through the emergencies of his own life. It must represent a kind of equipment within us by which we can actually solve problems, by which we can reindoctrinate ourselves with those principles that we need in order to uh, be adequate human beings. So when the bomb went off, and all these things happened, and the dazed world tried to understand, a well-established policy was first followed. Everyone more or less, at least symbolically, raised their eyes or their hands to heaven and said, what have we done to deserve this? Uh, why are our miseries so multiplied? Is it that like Job we are to be tested again? Why were such things permitted to happen? How was it that a kind, well-intentioned, good-natured, honest, honorable world found itself in such a mess? The answer was very simple. It had never been a kindly, good-natured, honorable, well-intentioned world. It had uh, that same kind of innocence that uh, spreads across the face of the small boy who has just been in the jam jar. He was in the jam again, but not the jar in this case. Actually, the atomic bomb was one of the inevitable consequences of man's instinct to competition. War is the most destructive form of competition. We have had war for thousands of years. In fact, some of our leading German military experts in their writings have said that we will always have war. For some reason hard to determine or hard to describe, uh, war appears to be the most popular occupation of man. Now, why does this have to so uh, appear? I think it is partly due to the fact that the average individual craves a certain kind of excitement in his own nature. And in the daily plotting of life, he finds little opportunity for that moment of glory, even though it may lead only to the grave. Thus war seems to arise in a certain combative instinct in nature. We find war in nature. But we also find that man is equipped very wonderfully to transcend the more barbarous processes present in the lower kingdoms of life. If man cannot be more peaceful than insect, he has achieved very little in the development of his own culture. But we do know uh, that philosophy has not yet been able to stop war. We know that religion has not been able to stop war. And we observe that wars have a tendency to start among peoples who have had many advantages and opportunities of learning and insight. It requires, therefore, a rather highly complex and highly intelligent people to be able, at this time, to engage in war, which is largely now a scientific procedure. Yet we have had these wars and rumors of wars for a long time. And the moral life of man has never been strong enough to cope with this type of emergency. It is a little humiliating, perhaps, to realize that the two most deadly wars of all time have been fought in our century. Not back somewhere in the Middle Ages, when men were illiterate and bigoted and fanatical, but in the comparatively cultured and opportunity-strengthened environment of modern man who is most of all in reasons to live, has been quickest to devise means to die. 
Thus we cannot assume that the processes of civilization, continuing as they are, will inevitably cure war. Nor have we any reason to believe uh, that attitudes that we hold, attitudes conditioned by traditional attitudes of the past, will be more productive of peace now than they were long ago. So philosophy has got to go deeper than this. The philosophy cannot solve the problem by saying there should not be war. Philosophy has to find out, if possible, why there is war and how it can be corrected by taking natural advantage of the aptitudes of the human being himself. In this emergency, philosophy becomes far more important to us, uh, perhaps, than psychotherapy. Uh, the psychic shock of the boss resulted in a distinct abnormal psychological situation. It gave us the greatest neurosis we have known. It also set us in one of the worst phobias that man has ever entertained. The psychological consequences, therefore, only can be met in one of two ways. Psychology says, by adjustment. Philosophy says, by understanding. Adjustment means primarily that the individual must learn to live as comfortably, as normally, as reasonably as he can while sitting on a bomb. He is supposed to go about business as usual. He is supposed, if necessary, to put a little cotton in his ears so that he will not hear the ticking of some incendiary mechanism concealed within uh, some instrument of war. To continue to be as we always have been, to live as we have lived and love as we have loved and hate as we have hate, hated, to get sick and get well again, to make fortunes and spend them, these were the common interests of man. These, according to psychological integration, must be restored or else the individual will become more and more introverted upon his problem and will become increasingly ill. Well, there is something to be said for this, and I suppose that it applies to a considerable measure of human life. There are a great many people who apparently just have neither the inclination uh, nor the inducements to try to think. Well, these people probably make an effort to bluff it through, to put on a good front, uh, to continue their small activities with as much courage as they can muster. Perhaps this is the only way. But it certainly is not really solutional of anything. Philosophy offers the most important of all considerations, and that is the philosophy makes it possible for us to understand through a situation of this kind and to orient ourselves in a large pattern of values which we have failed to consider and perhaps to move forward a little sadly but resolutely to the needs that must arise. So philosophy goes after the problem something in this way. There are two primary philosophical attitudes toward life. One is that life has meaning, and the other is that life has no meaning. Now if you belong to the group that believes that life has no meaning, then actually perhaps you are in a somewhat better condition immediately, if not ultimately. If you do not believe in the meaning of life, then you cannot believe in the meaning of your own life. Consequently, how long you live has very little to do with any valid fact. If, you're, if you have no meaning, no purpose 
no reason, no ultimate beyond the day, then if you are snuffed out this week or next week, it is not too serious. The sooner you go, the sooner you no longer have to pay taxes. <laughs> and I actually know individuals who have committed suicide so they would not have to pay taxes. Now this is one way, of course, of getting even with the government. <laughs> but it's not, uh, we will say, the most popular way. Evasion is more popular. Now, if you believe that there is no reason in this, and if you pass this concept on as a heritage to your children, so that they will live without reason, then life becomes a small pattern of profit and loss. Life becomes a very insignificant thing. And the life of the individual is not more meaningful than the life of a blade of grass that we trample underfoot. And the universe doesn't care whether we exist or not, for according to this viewpoint, the universe itself is a vast expanse of mechanistic unknowing. It goes on like a machine, age after age, millennia after millennia, era, age, epoch, following each other, but it isn't going anywhere, and it didn't come from anywhere, and it has no particularly valuable reason for having existed in the first place. Somebody started it, nobody knows when, and nobody cares. Now this, of course, has a certain simplicity about it. It is so simple that it is obnoxious. But a lot of people uh, try to live by it. These people should never be in a panic over things like bombs. Because after all, uh, the bomb is only important because it seems to interfere with something. If there's nothing to interfere with, it isn't important. Uh, it isn't important uh, to a man on his deathbed that a bomb will fall six months after he's gone. And if the individual is going nowhere and will never have any memory of how he died or what the conditions are in the world that he left behind, and he will not even have a memory or a thought concerning his own descendants, having descended himself into this quiet oblivion, what difference does it make? Now, this type of thinking has gained a certain amount of uh, strength, and we have some existentialists who feel quite keenly about it. The only difficulty with these people is that they are a bit unreasonable or inconsistent in their own attitudes. If life isn't going anywhere and isn't going to amount to anything, why is it that these people are, are so desperately anxious to live while they are alive? Why does this clinging to the moment mean so much to the individual if the moment itself is nothing? How are we able to get so tremendously worked up over spreading the gospel of unbelief when it makes no difference whether we believe or do not believe we will all forget and be forgotten. So we go out very much to champion the cause of our own non-existence. A rather, so we say, profitless undertaking. If on the other hand we are internally convinced and I think that most persons who are not sick in some way have a conviction in themselves that there is a reason for this life we live. That materialism is itself a byproduct of psychological sickness. That the individual who psychologically is so poorly adjusted with life that life is only hurting him continuously is the individual who also is attempting to commit a kind of psychic suicide by destroying his own vision of his own purpose and continuity. He is hoping for oblivion because he is unable to cope with meaning. If, however, he has a tendency to cope with meaning, then he is very likely to gradually line himself with the idealists, the individuals who are convinced that life has a meaning. Now, between these two, opposed or opposite, so to say, 
A number of bridges have been thrown at different times during the course of human experience. We have tried to, so to say, sit between two chairs and have only succeeded in falling between them. Uh, we have tried to take a little of materialism and a little of idealism and stir them up and make some kind of an acceptable brew that had some flavor in it. This particular type of mulligan, however, philosophically speaking, has never been very much good when it was called upon in an emergency. The idealist stands on certain principles, and these principles are sustained by an archaic, archetypal conviction inside of man. As a result of this conviction, being innate, being essentially part of our own humanity, as essential to our existence as the power to think or to feel, because we have this conviction, we are naturally inclined to accept the significance of purpose. And this acceptance has been universal among peoples. No civilization has ever risen to any height or sustained itself uh, on a cultural level for any length of time without this sense of interior life purpose. And very few individuals have ever succeeded in this world who did not sense purpose in themselves or realize a certain dedication to a concept, a conviction, an ideal, a principle, a belief, or a policy which was important. Now if we finally line ourselves with uh, the vitalists rather than the mechanists, with those who believe in value rather than those who believe in nothing. Then we are on a bit of a dilemma regarding our own weaknesses of character. So we try to rationalize this in the terms of what the modern world has in the form of its philosophical heritage with which to meet this tremendous imponderable that is becoming a little more ponderable all the time. If the universe has a purpose, uh, how is this purpose established? Is there at the root of existence a plan? Does this plan exist in the mind of a planner? Is there some will operating in space by which all things, by willing itself, are moved into the patterns and, and relationships that are essential. Religion naturally insists that this is true. The religious phase of the problem will be discussed in another evening. Tonight we are primarily concerned with the philosophical implications. Now philosophy is not only a process of reasoning, it is a process by which reason causes us to recognize what we really believe. Reason makes available to us our own convictions. For there is an instinctive tendency in the mind of the individual to accept the reasonable and to reject the unreasonable. He likes that which is reasonable and proper. So we have to decide in a sort of general way whether this universe is a conscious, intelligent, or reasonable creation. If it is any of these things, we are then confronted with a still more interesting speculation. If we wish to assume that the influence or power of things is to a measure dependent upon their relationship to other things, then we must assume that the universe, cosmos, universal systems, cosmic chains, this vast mass of worlds forming the inhabitants of space, this is pretty big. It is larger than we are. It is infinitely more powerful. And as far as we can conceive, it would be impossible for man to thwart the purpose by which the entire motion of existence is maintained. 
he might be able to blow our planet out of its orbit or some minor little thing like that. But as far as being able to alter the complexion of purpose, and even the most optimistic of us, uh, even the most egotistic, have certain reservations as to their own capacities in this matter. It becomes pretty obvious that this universe is run by an efficient process of law. That these laws are unchangeable and not to be corrupted by man. That these laws are infinite and eternal. That these laws are adequate to cope with any situation that can arise within the infinite processes of existence. Science is even suggesting a little now that probably the atomic fission which we have achieved is not the first example of this in space. Even assuming that men or creatures with intellect on other planets had never done anything like this or that nowhere in the cosmos is a group of scientists with the same degree of enthusiastic audacity. The fact remains the very processes of creation, the dissolution of solar systems, the absorption and re-emergence of cosmic chains, these very processes involve great chemical, electrical, physical phenomena infinitely beyond even our conception. Consequently, nature uh, must be large enough to take care of the sundering of a million cosmic chains and still be unperturbed. Because something is happening somewhere in space every second. And most of these happenings are bigger than anything we can even visualize or conceive of. If, therefore, there is a plan and a purpose, it appears to be large enough to take care of itself. And this is different from man who has never been large enough to take care of himself. If the universe, therefore, has in it some natural policy, we are then, in ethics, compelled to assume that whatever this pattern is, we must call good because it is impossible for us to conceive of something that is all-powerful and not good. Even if to the inhabitants of some other cosmic chain far, far away, uh, the policies of this one might not be acceptable. Still, for us, the way of the existence of which we are a part has to be good. There's no use arguing with it. If we want to call it bad, we can. But even beyond good and bad, it simply is. And about this fact, there's nothing we can do. Perhaps then we may say that our uh, personal interpretation of good is that we come into harmony with this plan and follow its rules and dictates and gain a certain security through obedience to that which we cannot disobey and survive. Thus good sets itself as one of the natural attributes of the creating power in which we have our hope. This power, philosophically considered, takes on the aspects of mind. It is infinite mind, universal mind, cosmic mind. And by extension, we may assume that it is also cosmic consciousness. For consciousness as we experience it is never entirely separate from mental phenomena. So at the root of existence, there has to be a mind or a mindfulness in which this plan exists, and by which uh, power this plan is perpetuated and continued to the infinite durations that we can barely um, seek to define. We cannot really experience them at all. 
Well, the philosopher moves on to the ground that the universe is real, that its laws are real, that its principles are essentially just, and that everything that happens in nature happens for a reason, and that it happens because it is necessary for it to happen. Or in some way, the that which occurs is acceptable to the plan, even though it may not be acceptable to man. Man, having somewhat an overestimated sense of his own ability to interpret the universe, um, cannot always justify nature. But he still has to abide by its edicts, whether he likes them or not. If then a thing like evil arises in our experience of the universe, it is like the ills that arise in our personal experience. They represent our own inabilities uh, to accept or adjust or obey, but they do not constitute weaknesses or failings in the cosmic plan itself. Philosophy, therefore, actually more or less assumes that the creator of things is the real or only true philosopher, and that therefore everything that this creator does is wise, thoroughly thought through with a wisdom that transcends human comprehension, and that consequently our problem is not to shake our fist and say why, in the sense of why does it happen. Our problem is to thoughtfully attempt to discover those reasons by which the happening has become inevitable. Now, if we think a little bit, we can do this pretty well with the problem of the bomb. We know that the bomb is a perfectly natural evolutionary progress in military armament. We know that day by day, century by century, we move from a rough stone hurled by hand to a slingshot, to a hatchet, to a bow and arrow, to a spear, a lance, a javelin, finally uh, to the beginning of machines of war, to the invention of gunpowder, round shot, shrapnel, many things of this nature, finally the comparatively primitive bombs of the last century and at last to the present situation. This has been the natural growth of man's means of destroying. This growth would not have been possible had man not continually excited it, made it happen, in the causes which he regarded to be righteous warfare. He used these means either for defense or offense, and he was perfectly willing to keep on doing these things and creating new instruments until he suddenly reached the point where the instrument turned on him and he discovered something so powerful that he became afraid of his own ingenuity. This is a perfectly natural procedure, just as natural as the growing of a child or the unfolding of a business policy. This was nothing exceptional, remarkable, or incredible. It was simply the fact that man had his eye on destruction, and he kept it there. And he became ever more proficient in the perfection of the means for destroying. Thus, it is not something that fell out of heaven, or something uh, which the devil whispered in his ear. It is something by which, gradually through the ages, he has sought more and more means for enforcing his demands and exploiting his fellow men. This situation, therefore, is little more or less than poetic justice, that it should come back upon him as he himself sent it forth. These facts, however, are not a great deal of consolation as we ponder the newspaper at the moment. But there are certain consoling principles that we have to bear in mind. First of all, philosophy teaches us that everything in the universe that is real is indestructible. Even science takes much the same attitude. 
If man wishes to regard himself merely as an animated body, and chooses to decide that if this body is blown up, that is the end of him, this is his choice. This is his interpretation. This is his learned and unreasonable answer to very definite problems. But the fact that he takes this attitude does not make it true, nor does it make it inevitable or factual in any sense of the word. One of our problems is, very frankly, that the average individual does not have any clear internal conviction on the subject of immortality. He has a hope that he may survive to a better place, but he is by no means convinced of it as far as his own daily living is concerned. He is not certain in his own nature that he is immortal. This uncertainty is racking his life desperately at this time. Furthermore, he has lived so long within the na narrow environment of his present physical existence that this has become tremendously real to him. The things he is doing have become tremendously real. The attachments have become tremendously real. And it is not uh, unreasonable or wrong that they should be very vivid in his consciousness. But as Buddha pointed out 2,600 years ago, as long as we make this world the sovereign reality and the conditions that exist here the most important things in our lives, we are going to live forever on the brink of ruin. There is no escape from it. If peace would produce, for example, physical immortality, so that we might continue in these various associations that we now like, and of course have to be bothered with some we do not like, that I might make a little more sense in this. But even this is not true. As somewhere in each life, we must discard all of it. We must discard every association and every acquaintance that we have. Some feel that it is better to pass out of this life uh, peacefully in bed, surrounded by our weeping relatives. This, uh, however, is uh, a little dramatic and nostalgic, uh, but uh, some of the individuals near transition have with their last feeble voice requested the relatives to leave so that they could die in peace. <laughs> so there is a great question as to whether there is uh, the happy way or the happiest way to depart from this world. But one thing is certain, regardless of how much money we have or how little, regardless of the status which we attain or do not attain, we are uh, ultimately to depart into that quiet and peaceful area which uh, Gray describes in his elegy to a country churchyard. This is the end for physical life as we know it for the person. If this then uh, becomes uh, a fact that we all finally accept it when we write our insurance policies, then why uh, do we build such a tremendous psychological pressure over this situation? Why not admit that we are here, that we came from a previous state of existence and that we will go to a subsequent state of existence? While we are here, we pass through certain experiences. It might possibly be a bad marriage, or it might be an atomic bomb, but they're both unpleasant while they endure. We may have grateful or ungrateful children. We may rise to station or continue in obscurity. But we came, we are here, and we will depart. Our real philosophic interest, therefore, is concerned with this power, this thing, this being that comes, abides, and departs, and not with the carcass that is going to be laid away in one of our better mausoleums. This division, therefore, between the person and the body, this recognition that man is a being, that man as a being has had an eternal existence and will have. 
that man as a being has gotten himself into trouble since the beginning of the great cycles of existence, and will probably get himself into trouble for a number of cycles into the future. But that by some wonderful machinery of the infinite, man has never been able to destroy himself. And in spite of all his noblest efforts in that direction, he never will. If we can begin to get this philosophical concept so magnificently expounded by Plato and Socrates and also so clearly enunciated by Buddha, we are in a much better condition to face the, the simple fact of life. And that is that we must all face transition, regardless of how it comes or where it comes from. And that therefore our primary purpose in being here is to live and to learn and to do and to grow and to help. With the full understanding that when our allotted time comes, that will be it. If we accept this as we accept other evident facts of nature, we will not be in a, a pandemonium over a particular incident that may arise. It was a tragic circumstance that two little boys were buried in the collapse of a little cave or tunnel they had built, or others had built for them, a few days ago. We know what this meant to the suffering parents. We know what this meant to the little ones themselves to be thus suddenly rejected out of our mortal way of life. But was anything killed, anything actually destroyed? Is this a tragedy in nature? Or is it simply an incident in a life that is so magnificently surrounded by protective machinery that true tragedy and real tra tragedy is impossible? If there is a tragedy at all in this universe, if there is a tragedy for man in this world, the real tragedy is that he shall leave here no better than he arrived. This is in turn offering certain choices. And the principal choices in each case are the choice of acceptance and the choice of rejection. And when experience is accepted, we move forward. When it is rejected, we start over again. Because we will continue until it is accepted. If we accept, therefore, a universal principle and recognize that this universe with its infinite magnificence, in which minute forms of life indescribable are perfectly ordered, vast orbits of universal motion without exception fulfilling their destinies, that everywhere the marvel of universal architecture in the form of the cell and the structure of minute sea creatures, the tremendous architecture of mountains and valleys, the blazing radiance of suns, the tremendous marching symphony of galaxies. All of these things are either ordered or they are not ordered. And we cannot look upon the universe. We cannot watch the calendar. We cannot observe the orderly sequences of the days and nights and months and years and centuries. We cannot measure the processions of the equinoxes or contemplate the phenomenon of the tides without being instinctively aware that we are in a universe ruled by facts, ruled by common sense, and ruled by principles that are not only enduring, but by their very nature have to be meaningful. And this meaning for man can only be one possible meaning. There is only one excuse for suffering, for living, for existing, for passing through the infinite concatenations of youth and maturity and age, there can only be one reason, and that is man is supposed to grow. That he is to mature something. That he is to achieve some greater knowledge or consciousness in himself than he might otherwise possess. That this consciousness or knowledge cannot be conferred vicariously even by God, but must be experienced by the living thing so that it becomes his own. And that this experience has as its ultimate 
as indicated by the truly great whom we have known in life and in history, as its ultimate in the production of the individual who is enlightened, who accepts, who is a patient, who is wise, and who is in all things as good as human nature can be. So nature is producing better human beings out of insight, out of experience. And through experience, man has his magnificent opportunity to grow and become a truly perfect creature in this world of which he is a part. So philosophy insists upon this basic realization. And also that there is in nature a law relating to causes and their effects. That everything in nature has to be exhausted in its causes before its effects can cease. And that each effect may lead to further causes by a process called in Buddhism the Nidanas. In this process, each of us, in solving a problem, creates a new one. In attaining a certain level of insight, becomes immediately responsible for the attainment of a further level. Thus, nature is everywhere operating with justice. And justice means always that good must be rewarded, and that the works of evil must be corrected, and that the individual who through ignorance or through perversion uh, betrays the laws of the universe of which he is a part, or violates them in his own action, this individual must be corrected. And correction must be impersonal, universal, and inevitable. And to achieve this, the universe has set into every pattern of existence its own consequences, so that a thing done inevitably produces a result like itself, for this result comes from itself. It is not bestowed upon it arbitrarily by some judge in space. All things have their own consequences within them. And when we set these actions in motion, their reactions are similarly vitalized and become immediately and inevitably associated with their corresponding actions. Consequently, the history of man is the history of man's motion from one problem to another, and the times in which he has evaded solution or has corrupted solution. And these times have in turn been followed by periods of affliction and adversity in which the very things he did produced their harvest in their own likeness and the man who enjoyed the deed did not enjoy the reaction that resulted therefrom. Philosophy therefore invites us to in investigate the nature of action in order that we may not at any time set in motion actions the consequences of which are difficult or impossible for us to sustain. Thus we have this uh, pattern moving us and moving with us through the mystery of space. There was never a time in which we needed to have an intimate and rather friendly and loving relationship with space as we now need it today. For actually these mysterious laws operating beyond us but also within us are the only hope we have. They are the justice which we seek in vain among the works of men. They are the, the eternal principles of honor, uh, which cannot fail, even though the conduct of men may be dishonorable. And we must sometimes make a choice, a very simple but direct one, as to whether we are willing to accept the universe and abide by its principles or whether we shall go on rebelling and resenting and denying and criticizing and condemning. These decisions, this decision is up to us. Now if we decide to accept and take therefrom a certain natural strength, uh, we observe that our psychic integration immediately improves. Uh, we are healthier and happier when we accept the best that we understand than we are when we resent the bad which we assume to exist. 
Well, we can say for all practical purposes that there are some pretty bad things that do seem to exist and pretty hard to deny them. And we don't advocate shutting our eyes to these problems. But we do advocate the thinking through of them to the degree that the badness goes out of them. And we see in them rather challenge and opportunity or are reminded of some basic error in our own judgment or conduct so that we are grateful for an adversity rather than resentful of it. If we get the thinking straight, we can begin to recognize that we live in a universe that is amply able to take care of us. And that also in taking care of us, it will do that which we need, not that which we want. And in taking care of us, it may sometimes use extreme methods uh, rather than to follow into the common, simple, happy ways that we would like to assume would, would represent parental indulgence. But actually, we are best taken care of when we permit the universe to do it and accept this care as we would the care of a loving parent, even though at a moment of punishment we may resent the parent. In the long run, we realize the wisdom of its actions, if these actions are wise. And in the case of this universal parent, an intelligent, wise enough and great enough to create this mystery is wise enough and great enough to administer it in a reasonable way. With this kind of thinking, then, we can le gradually learn to live with the bomb. We can learn to live with it, perhaps, only because we have to. But this necessity does not ne necessarily mean that we will live with it well. It will not necessarily mean that we can uh, give a good example to our children. So to this necessity must be added this internal enlightenment. To the necessity must also be brought the understanding so that we are able to adjust ourselves to a slightly different degree of impermanence than we have ever known before. But a degree which is not unique in space, in no way different from any other kind of impermanence. In the fall of 1923, a great earthquake hit the Japanese islands. In this earthquake, if the truth were known, and I suppose the truth will never be known because of the conditions and the situation, I would suspect strongly that a quarter of a million died. We became duly and properly perturbed over this, and we rushed help to them, and we did all that we could to ease this situation. But this emergency was just as great as an emergency caused by a bomb. The Lisbon disaster, more about 150 years ago or something like that, between 70 and 80, a thousand persons died in a few hours. There have been earthquakes in Asia, for example, that have shaken and torn to pieces areas larger than the United States in one quake. These things we call natural phenomena. And if villages and cities and towns are swallowed up, rivers are turned from their courses and inundate cities, or in another way, if cholera moves across Asia as it frequently does, there have been years when cholera alone has taken eight million lives, these things do not seem to frighten us so much. We don't want to be there when it happens. But it's a line or two in the newspaper underneath the football score. These things we take for granted. So that actually life to us subconsciously is not viewed as we consciously view it. Life to us is a perishable commodity. We know this. And we adapt to it in any way that we can. But the bomb is different. The reason why the bomb is different is because man is responsible for it. 
and he has the guilt of it on his own soul. He has no guilt for earthquakes. But that the bomb, he suddenly feels that he himself is destroying his own kind. That this whole thing is a sort of dishonorable suicide. This hurts him. It hurts him because man has always wanted to be regarded as the noblest of creatures. He likes to think he is far above the animal, far more advanced than primitive peoples, that he has a marvelous record of progress, and then crash, this thing explodes in his face, wiping away all his progress as far as its own psychic overtone is concerned. Perhaps we have to help man in this dilemma, help him to realize that although he has done this thing, all he has really done is built another kind of a castle in a sandbox and knocked it down. That actually, just as surely as he has overestimated his attainments, now he overestimates his own destructiveness. Well, what can he destroy? Nothing that worms would not ultimately take away. Someone said not too long ago that there was a killer loose in the world uh, that was more terrible than anything that we could command or imagine. And that this strange, insidious thing would, in the course of the next hundred years, take three billion lives. This killer is the death rate. We don't think about that too much. But... We didn't create the death rate. It is this moral thing that has come down to hurt us. It is this thing within ourselves in which we suddenly stand face to face with a kind of savagery and become aware of the atavistic tendency of our own conscience and our own consciousness in its lowest and least unfolded condition. So now we have to live with these facts also. We have to live with a philosophy. And the philosophy tells us very simply that the reason why man could create the bomb is because man forgot the most important part of his heritage, and that was the heritage of beauty and truth and love. That with all his haste and development, he considered canons to be practical and love a vanity of women. He considered good armament Necessary. Good ethics, not necessary. And so by degrees he bound himself to the causes of death, feeling that if he could control life and death, he could control man. That the one threat he could hold over the head of any man is the threat of death. And that for most people that threat would bring them to their knees. In the desperate effort to live, men would sell out everything that is real and valuable in life. They simply cling with their fingers dug into the earth, cling for a little longer to this right to be physically alive. This was the power of death. This is the power of death that Jesus sought to tell us had no longer any authority. But we didn't understand We didn't know the meaning of these words. We did not realize that death would be swallowed up in life. We were unable to orient these facts. Now we've gone along and we've had a fairly successful century. We have made a lot of money. Look like stocks are picking up a little. But the rise in stocks isn't as cheerful as it used to be. I heard a man say yesterday, they're going up, but why? (laughs) They're going up because it looks as though men would die. We're learning. And we have to learn a lot more. We have to learn the lesson that we refuse to learn in love. We have to learn this inevitable tragedy of the individual ignoring those values in his own consciousness which alone make him human. So if we can't do it, 
And if we won't do it, and we insist upon playing chess with human life, then we are breaking the rules. And it is necessary for us to discover the meaning of this in universal terms. But the fact that we may be seriously chastised for a very serious fault, because the universe has been more than patient with man. He has been a nuisance from the beginning, and many have regarded him as the most vicious parasite that was ever produced by nature. He has plundered everything and restored very little. He has given little of himself to the advancement of life, but has taken from life everything he could get. Nature says, this isn't cricket. This is not the way it's done, my friend. You had all kinds of wars, massacres. You have seen tragedy, sickness, crime, and death, but you've done nothing about it. You've gone merrily on your way, saying to yourself, uh, I can make a profit off of this war, and it'll be fought somewhere else. Nature says this won't work. And so now we find a more severe evidence of our own mistake. Now everyone is not involved in this mistake. Most people, as individuals, do not want to go to war. On the other hand, most people also in their various ways have been affected by this situation. War, in a little way, can be simply called selfishness, self-centeredness, unreasonable ambition, cutthroat competition in business, the desperate effort at status. All of these things are of the same essential substance of war. They are all wrong. They are all false and they are all dangerous to the common good of man. So we are all to a measure tired a little with the same brush, although in many ways we do not wish to believe that we are. If by any chance, and there will be a good many, we are not really in this classification. If to the very best of our own knowledge and understanding we have lived as good a life as we know how to live, how then shall we explain that we too may be within the dangerous area of fallout? How are we going to say that nature is going to be able to divide between the just and the unjust? How are we to assume that when one of these blasts go off, the worst will be near this to the center? We don't, because that may not be the place where the best or the worst can be found. There are those who, in case of atomic war, would die. There are those who would live. Which one would be in the more fortunate condition? How do we know? There might be some who would save what they are and lose what they have and would wish they were dead. But they will still live. There are others who may be snuffed out so instantaneously that they will be spared from ten years of arteriosclerosis. Which of them is suffering the worst? How do we know? We know that one thing is true, that out of every ten persons who might instantly be destroyed by a bomb, three would otherwise die of long, painful, lingering illnesses by natural causes. Who is being punished? How do we know? Might we not possibly suspect that the nature of the punishment involves very deeply and immediately the nature of the person upon whom the so-called punishment falls? The same destruction that will destroy the hope of one will release another in a tragic situation in which there is no hope. How do we know? The answer has to lie in the consciousness and the adjustment of the individual. And although many might perish in a single place, 
each will perish as an individual, each as a consummation of a situation in life, each according to the dictates of a pattern which they themselves have carried to some degree of maturity. There has to be some way in which this type of common disaster, like a natural disaster of equal magnitude, cannot be unjust. The only answer to this is that pain and pleasure, life and death, hope and fear, faith and doubt, all of these are as they are to the person himself. The individual who has attained insight, who is firm in his convictions, enlightened in his principles, like Socrates, faces death as the least important of all circumstances. It is not important to him. It is not important to him because he, first of all, has experienced beyond it. And to Socrates, it was more important to maintain the truth of a matter than it was to compromise that truth and walk free by the payment of a small sum of money. Socrates did not need to have died. But death was so unimportant to him that the fear of it, which controlled most of the men of Athens, did not touch him at all. Socrates could not have been injured by an atomic bomb. He could have been killed, but he could not have been injured. Nor could this thing have caused in him any unreasonable anticipatory apprehensions. He would not live in daily fear of what might happen and by this very circumstance live so miserably that if it did not happen, he then had no reason for life at all. He would continue to do these things which he knew to be right, and the length of life was simply of no unusual concern to him. He might take what precautions he could. He might do everything reasonable, but he certainly would not have wasted one hour in fear of something which he did not believe, and which in his heart he knew was not true, that is, that he was destructible. If then the individual, under the pressure of this tension, begins to look around, he may find these very answers, which in due time will be the end of war. Because war is valuable only because it destroys it destroys your enemy. If gradually we realize that this is not true, if gradually we come to know that the conqueror must live on and remember, that the individual who destroys must live with his own act into the futures beyond time, we might very well have peace in this world. But as long as we believe materialistically that we shall go quietly to sleep, no matter how many we have murdered, uh, we have no true moral pattern. We have no reason uh, for either goodness or evil. But we do see considerable reason to do as we please. Thus our philosophy has to come to our help here. And our philosophy, which can be a little bit of Zen and a little bit of uh, mysticism, a little bit of Greek thought, maybe a tiny touch of Taoism in China, we can slowly build up a tranquility within ourselves that enables us to live without being scarred, without having something of a sickness creep into our hearts by which all our values um, become pessimistic. In order really to live a critical, dissatisfied, antagonistic, disillusioned life, we have to be pretty poor in understanding of principles. 
We have to waste a lot of energy, and the chances are, the way we're functioning now, we will most of us die of acidosis before any bomb ever gets us. We are breaking down and breaking up. We are continually anticipating the worst, and we are living under nervous tension and stress, which is so acute, that we become obnoxious to ourselves, our families, our friends, and even downright strangers. This is noise. It is all part of this insecurity pressure that we have within ourselves. We call it anything we want to. We call it mature concern over serious matters. But there's nothing mature about it, and it is far more jitters than concern. It does not mean anything. It simply means that we have not the courage or the uh, immediate insight necessary to go out and think the thing through straight. Now, there is always a very good possibility that there won't be any bombs fall. There's always the very good possibility that man's subconscious has already learned a little bit and that nobody really wants to be the one to drop the first one. There might be also rather physical advantages in being cautious, because as these stockpiles rise, it becomes obvious that the destroyer must himself accept a tremendous attack of destruction from his adversary. The thing is sometimes regarded as a bit of a stalemate, and perhaps it will never happen that there will be an atomic war. This, again, points out that the greatest preventive power would be the gradual waking up of man to the magnitude of his own selfishness, his own stupidity. If he can awaken to what's wrong with him in time, he may save himself this entire terrible sequence. He sincerely and devoutly hoped that he will be able to do so. But if he does so, it has to be because he makes some improvement in himself. He must understand more deeply. He must accept principles more honorably. And he must also stand by truth more firmly. He cannot achieve peace by selling out to the enemy, nor by compromise. His greatest hope of peace the greatest chance that he has to live is the fact that he is not afraid to die. This is his hope of life. This is the hope of an honorable peace. Because if fear comes in, then compromise goes with it. And on compromise, we can never have any security in this world. But our great hope is that by not being afraid, we can prevent that which we fear. Now, there is much to support the possibility of such a reaction. And certainly it is the best reaction that the individual himself can cultivate. We have to live with this. Now we've got to learn to live with it in a very beautiful manner. Uh, there was a, uh, there was a, a case that, uh, a little bit on this order, it was a private problem, but it's not so far from it. Years ago, there was a very distinguished and cultured Japanese gentleman who had given his life very largely to beauty and to art and to literature and to culture. And one day he learned that he only had a few days more to live. He was an elderly man. A serious illness had invaded his body and it was only a matter of days. So the last day of his life, uh, he was assisted partly from his bed. He went down into another part of his house with the assistance of his family. And there, seated quietly on one of the mats of the floor, he gathered up the flowers for a flower arrangement. To him, this was the best way to go. With his last work here would be a labor of beauty that he would find in the gentle peace 
of bringing beauty according to his concept of beauty, that he had the answer. And shortly after he finished the arrangement, he passed on. But his last expression in life was not fear, nor hate, nor anxiety, nor doubt, but the simple continuance of an act of beauty. This was the way he wanted to go. If our world would live more like that, it would not go. Because it is where the important values are that our security rests. And if each person in his own life held beauty more sacred than life, love to be greater and deeper and stronger than pain, Quietly we would fulfill our various works, and in our due time quietly depart. This is the way nature intended. If man, by false values, by constantly creating artificial things and becoming the slave of them, has lost these simple dignities that are important. So if we can strengthen our culture, if we can strengthen our lives, if we can find new resources, if we can say very honestly that how long we live is not very important, but how well we live is of the utmost importance, and begin to think on this level, we probably will have life given to us. There are many stories told of very sick people who have had a, a great driving purpose in life, something that needed desperately to be done. And in a wonderful way, most of these people were given the energy, the strength, and the time to accomplish this necessary thing before they went. And they went when the work was done. This power to endure until the work is done is also shared by races and by nations. Races and nations grow old and die also or are absorbed into the currents of new peoples. But everything survives, it seems, as long as there is a work it must do, a purpose that is bigger than self. In this type of an emergency, therefore, when it is rather dangerous and painful to think about self, we have added inducements to live for larger purposes. We have more uh, inducement than ever before to enrich this being in the body so that if it goes and when it goes it goes forth best prepared and equipped for an existence in space for surely it will leave behind these things with which it is familiar but the principles of life which it has absorbed and contemplated and built in as character these are a heritage that will not fail. So what our atomic age is telling us in terms of philosophy is rather simple. It is simply telling us what we have always known, that everything here is transitory. This is just a little more obvious statement of it. Also, that each individual must gain a philosophy of life that is stronger than death. That death cannot be regarded as any longer either a nuisance or an interference. It must be regarded uh, with some of the same concept of understanding that Walt Whitman had when he wrote a beautiful poem to death. Death is a friend because in many ways it consummates the various activities of life. It breaks up patterns that could not otherwise be broken. It releases individuals from cycles in which they can no longer release themselves. It moves the individual out of situations back into universal opportunity so that he may redirect his courses according to his insight. These changes are not disasters. They are part of the eternal life of things, of which transition is merely an, an appearance, 
suns, moons, planets die. Everything passes from an active to a passive state. Everything is objective and then subjective. These tides are forever turning in the universe. Our main concern is that when men interfere with this tidal rhythm, suddenly death becomes a terrible thing because it is apparently caused by so terrible and horrible an instrument. But regardless of what causes it, it is the same. Regardless of what it is, each person must rise above it by an experience of his own consciousness. One of the Greeks said that all men in this world live for one reason, and that reason is that they shall learn how to die. There's a lot of wisdom in that, because death is one of the most honorable, the most magnificent experiences of life. It consummates life even more than does birth. And there is no episode between the birth and death that more gallantly calls upon all that we are or more perfectly reveals both our strength and our weakness. So that uh, in this issue we can move with a certain contentment even in an atomic age fully aware that nothing can happen to us that is not right and that if it is right that this should happen then it is because there is an end beyond far greater. That this is only an appearance, but that the substance behind this appearance is eternal good and eternal love ever moving. It is always easy to see love in those who do things to please us, but we must also learn to see love in the wisdom of heaven that does that which is best. This is our understanding. This is what philosophy does for us. And this is how we can take philosophy and apply it to the problem of this time. And if we can apply it well, we shall achieve more than one end. We shall not only attain a, a quietude, a gracious acceptance of inevitable, which is the most important conservation of energy possible to us, but we will set a good example for a world that is shaken and, and, and rather sick about it all. For in these times, it is important that philosophy shall enable us to walk upon the surface of the ocean and say unto the waves, Be still. This walking upon the ocean is man's ability to walk quietly across the surface of eternal change unaffected by it, that the individual has the power to say to the tempest, be still. He also has the power to say to his own heart, be still and know. These are important discoveries, and we probably would have been 500 years slower in attaining them had not our scientific skill suddenly brought this crisis upon our world. We were headed that direction for a long time, but suddenly it happened. And like all emergencies, we are not always prepared when they happen, even though we know they will come. But this emergency is also our great opportunity, where it suddenly brings home to us the importance of all the neglected areas of knowledge, the wonders of religion, the beauties and truths of philosophy. It also causes, causes us to come into great and clear insight into the true wonders of science and how this particular thing is also the shadow of the good that man could do if he could turn his ingenuity to the service of his neighbor rather than to the destruction of an enemy. We have learned that now that science can explore far into the mystery of life, and that can also make great and good discoveries if its conscience and its heart will lead it in the right direction. We are recognizing that we live in a world of powers that we never knew before, and we now must adjust uh, to the right action of these powers. Uh, part of the Abushito, or great code of the Japanese gentleman, used to be that a samurai carried a sword and as Prince Toko said, the sword is a weapon. 
and it is a test of character. The gentleman will draw his sword to protect his honor or to protect the honor of others. But the strong man is the one who wears the sword but is too wise to draw it. He is stronger if he wears the sword because then the temptation to draw it is more real. But his great virtue lies that holding it in his hand he will not use it. Long ago, perhaps, Shikoku Kaishi uh, sensed something. Today, we hold in our hand a weapon far more keen than the sharp, curved blade of the samurai. If we are a gentleman, if we are wise, if we are honorable, we will use it to protect the good and to protect honor. But if we are still wiser, we will use this weapon as a symbol that we can hold it and not use it. And this is the symbol of our own self-control. And today we need that self-control. Never before have we had as great an opportunity to be good. Or never before have we had such a ready means of being evil. So if we can hold this tremendous discovery in our hands, but be too wise to ever use it, we may gain a lesson that thousands of previous years have never been able to teach us. So we have to face these lessons and we have to face the life that they bring. And in this time, realize that we were not left alone in our extremity like poor old Cardinal Wolsey. We are not left alone. We have been provided with all the means of insight that we have ever needed. We have available to us all instruction, all insight, all inspiration of beauty, truth, love, art, literature, ethics, and culture. These things are all available to us. The solutions are available and are at hand. We only need to reach out and take them. And the thing that must cause us to reach out is this something within ourselves that waking to the seriousness of the occasion chooses at this time to make the simple decision of right action. If this is accomplished, tragedy may well be averted. But if it cannot be averted, it will be a tragedy only to those who do not understand. The rest will accept it. Face it. Move through it to the eternal victory that is the inevitable birthright of the human soul. Well, time is up. I think for this evening.